DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Terrence Wright, who is an Associate Professor of Philosophy and the Director of the Pre-Theology Program at St. John Vianney Theological Seminary in Denver, Colorado. His academic interests include phenomenology and personalism, particularly the work of Edith Stein, Emmanuel Mornay. He has also published on the relationship between philosophy and literature. With Terence Wright, we go inside the pages of Dorothy Day, an introduction to her life and thought, published by Ignatius Press. Terence, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. What an outstanding book, Dorothy Day, an introduction to her life and thought. I loved every page. It, it, you were so wonderful in covering all of the aspects of her life. Okay. What compelled you to write it? Because a lot of us love the saints, but it's another thing to invest so much in your life in trying to bring forward their lives and thoughts. Um, two things, I think, really. One is, I do think Dorothy Day is one of those people who people sometimes hear the name but don't really know much about them, Mm -hmm. and that there really wasn't, um, I thought, a good sort of introductory book out there. There are a lot of very good books on Dorothy Day out there, but one that you could just sort of pick up and go to as a way of getting into reading her and studying her. I didn't think that book was there. Uh, The other thing that drove it is that I thought she's sort of misunderstood. She's often thought to be for lack of a better term, a dissenting Catholic. And Mm -hmm. I think that some people on either side of the debates kind of identify her as that. But if you really take the time to read her and and see what she wrote and did, you really see, I think, that she's a very faithful daughter of the church. And I was trying to clear up that sort of misconception about her. Yeah, one of the reasons for the misconception, I think, in some ways, is that there are those out there who feel that she is— I hate to say it this way, Terrence, but she's not worthy to be a saint. Yeah, there are some people who say that, yes. And I think that is such a misnomer. You have to go back and you have to look at the fruitfulness, not only of the work that we're very familiar with, the public work, but how God really began at planting seeds so long ago. Those first chapters in which you go back and you look at that childhood— and then you look at those little influences, even the the role of Mrs. Barrett. Right. That makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you really see that she was um, the she was always drawn to uh, to God, even at the times in her life when she tried to push him away. I think most uh, deliberately, um, it just never she couldn't really. Um, get away from him. (laughs) And so it's always present in her life. And it really does inform so much of her life that, uh, that it is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, um, story. And, um, I think, you know, there's, there's no doubt that she, uh, she did things in particularly when she's in her early twenties, which were very, uh, uh, startling in some sense for a woman her for at, at that time period and so on. And, um, you know, and so she, she did have some very difficult times and, you know, I mean, uh, she had an abortion when she was 21. Um, she had a failed marriage by the time she was 23 or 24. So there are events in her life that people might want to point to and say, well, how can we say that woman's a saint? But, um, you know, there's a lot of saints who can sort of tell similar stories. You know, St. Augustine comes to mind. And, um, you you know, but the, the, what you can't miss is how that call that God was making to her never goes away and that she finally answers it. And uh, it's really a a beautiful story. It really is. You know, as you were relating some of those, as she would say, the the horror of her life, Mm -hmm. the great horror of that abortion and her Mm -hmm. marriage that failed. You know, I I mentioned that the example of Mrs. Barrett, that was a childhood friend's mother. Mm -hmm. Her piety captured Dorothy's heart. And It's like those types of seeds that are planted, it takes those horrific moments sometimes to break the soil so that they Mm -hmm. can grow. I mean, and that's, I think, what you you bring out so well in the book. Yeah, I think, I mean, and I think there's often in her life, there are those moments that she's not even really sure what it is that's drawing her or attracting her. 
but there is something there that she knows that there's something more that's that's there. And so just in those small acts of piety that she sees in other people, or sometimes she would just go to see the, I think initially just the beauty of the Catholic liturgies. But um, there was something about that that was always kind of uh, speaking to her. Isn't that something, I mean, uh, that entrance into the church that day where she was experienced benediction. Mm-hmm. And again, it was the example, what was happening not only the the unseen grace that flows from those kind of encounters, but also the witness of those around her that really appealed to her, didn't it? It did, yeah. I mean, there's this. There's she talks about when she moved to New Orleans for a period of just going to benediction and not really knowing what was going on, but kind of just having that sense that something important was happening, you know? And, mm-hmm. and so, and then a friend of hers gave her a rosary, which again, she really didn't know how to pray, but she knew there was something important about this. And so you get those moments in her life that, uh, you know, really, like I said, I mean, she, 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 God was clearly calling her even at the times when she was maybe not wanting to hear that call, but it's, it's always present. Isn't that Terrence, the, the way of conversion? I mean, it, it's sloppy. Some, in most <laughs> lives, aren't they? I mean, it's just it's sometimes it's just sloppy. Right, right. Yeah, this is, and it's a, it's it's a kind of a, a slow process for her. I mean, there's a, there isn't. I mean, I think there, the birth of her daughter after she was um, again uh, out of wedlock, but uh, that you know she really thought that she wasn't going to be able to have children after the abortion, and she really took. The um, her pregnancy with her daughter and then the birth of her daughter is really a sign of God's mercy, and um, and that is really the kind of the event that eventually brings her into the church. But uh, again, it was a, a slow process and, like you said, sloppy. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't this like one moment. Um, it was it was something that was going on throughout her life. Well, how remarkable too! I didn't realize until I read your book that. Her confirmation name when she came into the church, she chose Maria Teresa, Teresa mm-hmm. for Teresa of Avila. I, I knew Therese right. was a, an important figure for her because she would ultimately write a biography right. uh, about Therese. But right. Teresa of Avila, what, I mean, what do you suppose that influence was? Um, she was, it was, um, the, she was attracted, I think, just because she was another kind of powerful, strong woman. Um, I mean, you know, Dave was a, you know, was a, I mean, she started as she was a journalist. I mean, she was, she was kind of a groundbreaker in some ways in that sense. And so, I mean, she was attracted to that model of a, of a strong woman. And I think of a, of a saintly woman. And I think she thought there was a certain joy and, um, yeah, I think joy is the best, best word for it that she thinks that she found in, in, um, Teresa of Avila, and a certain appreciation of the sort of beauty of life. And that's that was, I think, the attraction there. As you know, Teresa of Avila, I mean, she writes in her life about the things that tempted her. And she was very aware of, you know, that, for, I, I don't know how else to say it, but that darker side of herself mm-hmm. that kept coming up and biting her. And I think when you read Dorothy Day's story, especially in those earlier years, in her early twenties, mid twenties, do you think she could identify with that? Yeah, I mean that that's definitely a, a part of it, also. And I mean, I think what's kind of interesting is, particularly with the relationship with the uh, the man who was the father of her daughter, Foster Batterham. I mean, that was a she loved. I mean, when you read about her um, description of her life with him, it's clear she loves him very much, and he loves her very much, and. Um, it was very hard for her to end that relationship when she when he refused to marry her. He she knew that as a Catholic she could not continue on in this uh, relationship with him, and uh, and that was a, that was not an easy decision, but it was a very clear decision to her. And I think you know there, so and she, there was a sense in which she knew she had to sort of separate herself from him physically. She moved. She spent some time in Florida. She moved to California, but um, just because there was such a temptation there because that love was so strong, but she was not going to continue that relationship outside of marriage. And, um, and so, you know, she, so she, she had those temptations. I mean, she, she's, um, it's not that she didn't understand those relationships. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She, she appreciated the beauty of them, 
but also the sense in which that relationship couldn't continue. Let's talk about a hero of the new evangelization, and I'm and I'm talking about a nun. No one probably knows who she is. Dor- Here's Dorothy Day at this moment. She wants to have her child baptized. She doesn't right. know how to go about doing it, and she encounters this woman who just accepts her where she's at and and helps her. Yeah, that's a kind of a beautiful moment that this you know she just sees this nun walking along the beach and comes up and says, "I want to have my child baptized," and this. And yeah, the nun is sort of like, of course you do. You know, like she's not at all surprised. <laughs> of course you want to have your child baptized. And just takes Dorothy and her daughter under her wing and just works her through the process. And it's it really is a just a sort of beautiful story and, and gets Dorothy to see that um she can't raise her daughter Catholic unless she herself is Catholic and realizes you know, there's this is not gonna be easy, but that we'll get through this together. And she really is just a uh, you know, just a, such a grace at that moment in her life, that's the person that she encounters. No judgment. And no judgment. No. No. And that's, that is, because it's funny, there she, there's a story that um, Dorothy Day tells of um, that when she went and was baptized, um, she said that somebody said that someone asked her about staying around for something. And she says, oh, I got to get back to my daughter. And the, this woman said, oh, I didn't know you were married. And she said, I'm not. And the woman's face just dropped because she was like, who did we just baptize this woman <laughs> who's, married, who's not married and has a child? So there was that sort of judgmental experience, but that nun, the nun just did not do that. That was not, that she, she knew what Dorothy needed and, and gave, it, gave her what she needed at that moment. The nun is Sister Aloysius. The thing about her is, again, we talk about the new evangelization. It it was because of her willingness to journey with her and just accept her where she's at and continue to point her in that conversion. And that's the model for how we are to encounter others, because you just never know. Did she know? Did she, this nun live long enough? We, I'm, I'm guessing we don't know, to see the fruits of of that life that she encountered that day on the beach. Yeah. I mean, I think, yes, yeah, I mean, you're right. Cause I mean, it's just the whole notion of the accompaniment that we are called to accompany people where they are um, and, and to try to lead them as best we can towards, um, towards Christ. And, you know, and I think that she is, she's just a wonderful example of that. I mean, she was, I, was, I mean, she was sister. I she was, uh, she was a retired sister of charity Um and uh, so I don't know how much longer she lived or how how she and Dorothy maintained the relationship. Um, she never talks about that. She just kind of appears at that moment. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's a beautiful part of the story. I see her as that figure from The Trouble with Angels, Rosalind Russell, that type <laughs> of nun, you know? Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, you know, we, I mean, and it's, I mean, if we think of our own lives, there's always, the, sometimes those people do just kind of, show up at the right moment at the right time. And, uh, you know, we, we don't always recognize them at, at first. Even after she comes into the church and she's trying to, to make a living for her daughter, she ends up in Hollywood. I know. Oh, my gosh. Well, Good luck. Yeah. Well, yeah, she's so I mean, that's one of the things I love about her is there's something so um, just you know, so caught up in the times and so, in lack of a better term, so American about her. You know, she mm-hmm. just lives all over the country. But she has, so she she travels for a while with her daughter. You know, there she is, single mother, uh, goes out to to work as a screenwriter for a time. Uh, and then the Great Depression hits and, and the uh, the um, studio goes under and she, she loses that job. But yeah, that's just kind of, I mean, just the kind of, um, and again, she's kind of, it's just an interesting interesting model of a of a woman who is really um very independent and very powerful in a sense um you know at, at a time then that when that was less typical yeah and she really was affected by matthew chapter 25 yes and you talk about taking root in someone's heart that along with maybe the sermon on the mount are probably maybe the two uh two key Mm-hmm. scripture passages to understanding Dorothy Day. Um, you know, the, uh, the idea that, um, you know, when, when you, when you, when you saw me hungry and naked, you know, it wasn't, 
that the poor in that situation really are Christ. It's not mm-hmm. just a metaphor. It's not just a, 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 you know, a symbol, but to really recognize Christ in the other is what shapes, I think, the rest of her life. Oh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to talk about her relationship with Peter Morin. That is, that's a key relationship. It is. You know, Peter Marin, um, who served as seen as the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, he was about 20 years older than Dorothy Day. And um, we don't really, he's kind of a, we don't really know all that much about Peter Marin. He never wrote his biography or his autobiography or anything like that. But he was, um, I think the story of their first meeting is so interesting. She had traveled to, um, she had been given an assignment to cover um, a um, hunger march in Washington, D.C. in December of 1932. And she was really um, drawn to uh, what she saw as the nobility of these protesters because of their suffering and their hunger, but they were still there trying to get their voices heard. And she really wanted to figure out a way to sort of combine her Catholicism and her talent as a writer and her own sensibilities uh, to to serve the poor and to figure out how to do that, which she hadn't really been able to to find a way to do that. So she went to the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception on uh, the campus of Catholic University, and it was on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And she goes and she prays to the Blessed Mother for some way to be able to bring together all these different parts of her life and the next day when she returns to New York, uh, Peter Marin is sitting in her kitchen talking with her sister-in-law. Um, and that's the person who she's going to found the Catholic worker with, and that which will become the, the, the story of the rest of her life. And so he, is, he has a sort of vision, Peter Marin has a sort of vision of uh, what he wants to achieve. Real quickly, they're having basically three points. Uh, one is houses of hospitality where the uh, the poor and the homeless can be served, um, a newspaper where Catholic social teachings and Catholic um, understandings of, the, of social problems can be explored and explained. And then he also saw uh, the desire to open up uh, farms where uh, people could work. And so the, the, nobody's unemployed on a farm, as he would say. They would work. They would raise food both for themselves and for the houses of hospitality. So he had this kind of vision but it was really Dorothy Day that kind of had the um, the force to kind of really bring that into um, into reality. That they the two really complemented each other so well in that way, and so she saw particularly the uh, the newspaper as really appealing to her abilities and her talents as a writer, but also seeing them you know as a way of practicing the. Uh, spiritual works of mercy. You know, this is how you're going to instruct the ignorant, comfort, uh, you know, uh, admonish the sinner, uh, comfort the sorrowful. <laughs> I mean, you mm-hmm. know, that this was going to be a tool for that. So, the, in a sense, the houses of hospitality were more about the um, uh, uh, corporal works of mercy, feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. Um, but the uh, the newspaper, I think, was really for her the the tool of the uh, of the spiritual works of mercy. And when you mentioned when you were talking about how to get this done, I mean, I kept thinking of the word chutzpah. I mean, right. because, but that is that's grace filled. I, I mean, in a very grace filled chutzpah because she was again her Catholic faith, and especially her the the life of faith in her was so nurtured by so not it, it, the sacraments, yes, but it was also the discipline of what she would experience, I have to say, as a Benedictine oblate, Mm -hmm. in a very real way, because a lot of those attributes, everything, especially those houses of hospitality, that's so Benedictine. And Mm -hmm. prayer and work and and all those things, that really was manifested in in her in a very real way, don't you say, think? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, the whole, I mean, I think work and prayer really do... um, you know, des- describe her life. I mean, that's what it becomes. And, and that she recognizes that, you know, each need the other. Um, and yeah, you know, she doesn't think she, she knows she couldn't accomplish what she had accomplished if it weren't for her prayer life and her also the, her, the sacraments and, and, and so on. And, but at the same time, um, you know, the work informed the prayer life. I mean, it was, it was very Benedictine in that, in that sense. And, um, and, and, and it is a certain, 
you know, I mean, it's interesting the notion of sort of chutzpah or just um, the the ability to get things done and and not to be uh, and and to overcome obstacles. You know, she, uh, I mean, she meets Peter Marin in December of '32, and the first edition of the paper comes out May 1st of '33. I mean, very clearly, very quickly, they saw what they were going to do. They had to find the resources to to get that done, but um, she she knew she she had a very she was very practical in the sense that she knew how to get things done. This is a remarkable time too in this particular era of the 20th century because we also have she is a compatriot of sorts, uh, Catherine de Hewitt Doherty, mm-hmm. uh, doing in the same not exactly the same thing, but. Darn close, fueled yeah. by that same devotion uh, with the Madonna houses in her work, and where Dorothy wrote, Catherine de Hewitt Doherty spoke. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was a speaker, but they, but it was coupled with both prayer and action. Right, and they they knew each other, so that's um, not surprising. Dorothy Day is a writer. I mean, I think it's one of the the other engaging things about her is, you know, she's, she wrote a lot of books, and for people who are interested, there's so, so there's a lot of her writings there. Plus all the contributions she made to the Catholic Worker and to other other publications, and um, and she's a good writer. You know, I think people can, can can get into her and understand her. She's very clear and she's a very good writer, and I think that that's a a great great talent that she had. We're uh, again we're talking with Terence Wright about his book Dorothy Day, an, an introduction to her life and thought. And I I love the whole design of the book. I lo- I love the fact that you know we we get. Such a wonderful cross section of flavor of her life, but also of her devotional life and uh, her mm-hmm. spiritual life. Truly, I do cherish those final chapters in which you talk about her years uh, as she has gotten older and the experiences that she's had. It, praise God for the life of her daughter, Tamar. Yeah. Making her a grandmother and a great grandmother. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that's um, Kate Hennessy, who is one of. Dorothy Day's uh, granddaughters has written a, a lovely book um, called The World to Be Saved by Beauty that really looks very closely at the relationship between Dorothy Day and her daughter. And it was not always an easy relationship. I mean, I, there was definitely um, uh, conflicts and and um, and some some difficulties. Uh, you know, it's hard to be the daughter of a saint, um, mm-hmm. and uh, and and you see that. So I mean, it's it, she's you know, it's a very human. Um, story and it's you know it's it's not it's not it's not always easy but again particularly at the end of her life i mean tamar um was really there for dorothy in those last uh, those last years and 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 dorothy took great comfort in that and and then that she was actually present when when dorothy uh, passed away was was i think a great blessing for her and how about that reemergence of the great love of her life the father of right. her child. They form a friendship there at the last years of their life as well. And, and actually they make sort of a, 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 you know, a couple where they just, you know, they'll sit and watch movies at night or something. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he was always in her life because he was the father of Tamar. And, and so he definitely had a role to play. And Dorothy never tried to, to cut that out of, uh, of Tamar's life or didn't, or not recognize his, his role to play as, as Tamar's father. So I don't think there was ever that kind of conflict. I mean, um, he, you know, and again, part of that was just out of the fact that she, she did love him. Um, she thought that there was definitely qualities there that were, um, were lovable. And, um, and so, you know, they, but they're able to kind of reconcile, um, in those last years and in her, you know, the last years of her life, while she's not as productive, um, they're very rich in her spiritual growth. You know, the, this is the thing about her legacy, isn't it, Terrence? I think when we look back on the totality of her life, those early years, what may have seemed extraordinary, I mean, maybe not as much as we thought, just because there isn't the the broadcasting of our family histories. I mean, there's always mm-hmm. something going on in our histories, isn't there? That, you know, grandma doesn't talk about that, or, you right, know, we right. didn't hear about that. But today, her story is in a very real way a a normative for many. Mm-hmm. She's so relatable. We need this life to look at yeah. and to to embrace. You sometimes see attached to her, you know, a saint for our age. But I do think that that's more than a cliche. I mean, I really think that that is true. Um, her story, um, you know, her her profound experience of God's mercy 
is um, is something that a lot of us, you know, need and and have to know is is out there. And uh, and I so I think she's such a witness to that. Um, you know, I think that she really is. Um, I think her story just does resonate with with contemporary experience. Not only has Cardinal Dolan spoken of her as that great witness to mercy, but also Pope Francis has mentioned her. Mm-hmm. So when is this happening? I mean, when are we going to get this done? I mean, Servant of God uh, is I, beautiful, I, but let's get at least venerable going yeah, here. Yeah, I, I know that. I mean, the process is still going on. There's a guild established, um, and they have a wonderful website for anybody who's interested, uh, the Guild for Dorothy Day. Uh, there's a beautiful prayer there for her canonization, which if, you are, uh, if you're interested, that's a good, good place to start to promote her cause. Uh, you know, they're, they're still collecting um, the testimonies. They're still hopefully, uh, you know, some uh, the possibility of a miracle is, you know, they're hoping for that. Um, I mean, you know, I would love to see her canonized, um, you know, and, and I think, uh, I, you know, uh, it's, you know, it is the case that Pope Francis spoke glowingly of her when he was here in the United States. So, I mean, our, we are hopeful that it might happen soon. But I'm I'm I don't know where really where they where, where they're at in the process. Even more than that, I would suggest, and I'm I'm sure maybe you would agree with me, Terrence, that if there are parents out there that are worried about their children, f- pray with Dorothy Day. Ask her to come mm-hmm. in there and and to pray with you. And or if you're someone who feels that uh, you know I'm lost in that long loneliness, you feel mm-hmm. lonely. At Dorothy Day is the one you can. Uh, Call on her. Ask her to come and pray with you. Ask her to be there with you in in, in this cloud of witnesses. It, she really is a, a person that you can turn to. She wanted to reach out to the poor and the lost and the lonely. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine a, a better tribute than your book as well. I think you, okay. you've done such a beautiful job. I wish we had more time. Any final thoughts? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I appreciate all that. I mean, I think that she is, you know, I've always felt that she's accompanied me in a certain sense. And what's what's kind of interesting, because uh, I've written stuff on Edith Stein as well, that when you write about somebody who's a saint, you really can just kind of pray to them to help you with the with the project. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. sort of a, you know that, so it would, you know, I would go to the chapel if something, you know, if I say like a stumbling block or something and just say, okay, I need help with this. And uh, and so, you know, the the saints are out there for a reason. <laughs> it's okay to talk to them. Well, I would imagine uh, you had some fine conversations with her. <laughs> they were interesting. <laughs> I bet. Thank you. Um, uh, and again, Terrence Wright, we thank you so very, very much. Thank you. With Terrence Wright, we've gone inside the pages of Dorothy Day, an introduction to her life and thought. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to Ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press. Or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we ask that you tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, Insights from Today's Most Compelling Authors.